Abraham Lincoln's position on slavery is one of the most discussed topics in American history. Lincoln often expressed moral opposition to slavery in public and private. Initially, he attempted to bring about the eventual extinction of slavery by stopping its further expansion into any U.S. territory and by proposing compensated emancipation an offer Congress applied to Washington, D.C. in the early part of his presidency. Lincoln stood by the Republican Party's platform of 1860 stating that slavery should not be allowed to expand into any more U.S. territories. He worried that the extension of slavery in new western lands could block free labor on free soil. As early as the 1850s, Lincoln had been politically attacked as an abolitionist. Howard Jones says that, "...in the pre-war period, as well as into the first months of the American Civil War itself, Lincoln believed it prudent to administer a slow death to slavery through gradual emancipation and voluntary colonization rather than to follow the abolitionist and demanding an immediate end to slavery without compensation to owners." In 1863, Lincoln ordered the freedom of all slaves in the areas, in rebellion, the Confederacy, and insisted on enforcement freeing millions of slaves, but he did not call for the immediate end of slavery everywhere in the U.S. until the proposed 13th Amendment became part of his party platform for the 1864 election. In 1842, Abraham Lincoln had married Mary Todd, who was a daughter of a slave owning family from Kentucky. Lincoln returned to the political stage as a result of the 1854 Kansas Nebraska Act and soon became a leading opponent of the slaveocracy. The political power of the southern slave owners. The Kansas-Nebraska Act, written to form the territories of Kansas and Nebraska, included language, designed by Stephen A. Douglas, which allowed the settlers to decide whether they would or would not accept slavery in their region. Lincoln was outraged by the repeal of the 1820 Missouri Compromise, which had outlawed slavery above the 36-30 parallel. During the Civil War, Lincoln used the war powers of the presidency to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, in January 1863. He had warned in September 1862 he would do so if the Confederate states did not return. It declared, "...all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free." but exempted border states and those areas of slave states not in rebellion and therefore beyond the reach of the constitutional war power to emancipate. It immediately changed the legal status of all slaves in the affected areas, and as soon as the Union Army arrived, it actually did liberate the slaves in that area. On the first day, it affected tens of thousands of slaves. But when the war ended, in April 1865, only about 15% of the slaves had actually been freed. Full abolition was achieved later that year, with the ratification of the Thirteenth Amendment, abolishing slavery everywhere in the United States. <laughs> Early years Lincoln was born on February 12, 1809, in Hardin County, Kentucky now LaRue County. His family attended a separate Baptist church, which had strict moral standards and opposed alcohol, dancing, and slavery. The family moved north across the Ohio River to free i.e., non-slave territory and made a new start in then Perry County, now Spencer County, Indiana. Lincoln later noted that this move was, "...partly on account of slavery," but mainly due to land title difficulties. As a young man, he settled in the free state of Illinois. Topic: 1840s to 1850s. Topic: Legal and political. Lincoln, the leader most associated with the end of slavery in the United States, came to national prominence in the 1850s, following the advent of the Republican Party, whose official position was that freedom was national. The natural condition of all areas under the direct sovereignty of the Constitution, whereas slavery was exceptional and sectional. Earlier, as a member of the Whig Party in the Illinois General Assembly, Lincoln issued a written protest of the Assembly's passage of a resolution stating that slavery should not be abolished in Washington, D.C. In 1841, he won a court case Bailey v. Cromwell, representing a black woman and her children who claimed she had already been freed and could not be sold as a slave. 
In 1845, he successfully defended Marvin Pond, People v. Pond for harboring the fugitive slave John Howley. In 1847, he lost a case Matson v. Rutherford representing a slave owner Robert Matson, claiming return of fugitive slaves. While a congressman from Illinois in 1846 to 1848, Lincoln supported the Wilmot Proviso, which, if it had been adopted, would have banned slavery in any U.S. territory won from Mexico. Lincoln, in collaboration with abolitionist Congressman Joshua R. Giddings, wrote a bill to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia with compensation for the owners, enforcement to capture fugitive slaves, and a popular vote on the matter. After leaving Congress in 1849, Lincoln became somewhat less active in politics until he was drawn back into it by the Kansas Nebraska Act of 1854, which allowed territories to decide for themselves whether they would allow slavery. Lincoln was morally opposed to slavery and politically opposed to any expansion of it. At issue was extension into the Western Territories. On October 16, 1854, in his Peoria speech, Lincoln declared his opposition to slavery, which he repeated in his route to presidency. Speaking in his Kentucky accent, with a very powerful voice, he said the Kansas Act had a declared indifference, but as I must think, a covert real zeal for the spread of slavery. I cannot but hate it. I hate it because of the monstrous injustice of slavery itself. I hate it because it deprives our Republican example of its just influence in the world." Impressed by the strength of anti-black racism, especially in his home states of Indiana and Illinois, Lincoln concluded because whites would never allow blacks to live in America as equals, they would be better off migrating voluntarily to a colony outside the United States, ideally in Central America or the Caribbean. He had little faith in the program of the American Colonization Society, whose goal was to colonize American blacks in Liberia, on the West African coast. In a speech at Peoria, Illinois, Transcribed after the fact by Lincoln himself, Lincoln pointed out the immense difficulties of such a task are an obstacle to finding an easy way to quickly end slavery. If all earthly power were given to me, my first impulse would be to free all the slaves, and send them to Liberia, to their own native land. But a moment's reflection would convince me that whatever of high hope, as I think there is, there may be in this, in the long run, its sudden execution is impossible. According to historian Paul Escott, Lincoln thus favored a system of gradual emancipation that would allow for controlled management of free Negroes. <laughs> Letter to Joshua Speed In 1855, Lincoln wrote to Joshua Speed, a personal friend and slave owner in Kentucky, You know I dislike slavery, and you fully admit the abstract wrong of it. I also acknowledge your rights and my obligations, under the Constitution, in regard to your slaves. I confess I hate to see the poor creatures hunted down, and caught, and carried back to their stripes, and unrewarded toils, but I bite my lip and keep quiet. In 1841 you and I had together a tedious low-water trip, on a steamboat from Louisville to St. Louis. You may remember, as I well do, that from Louisville to the mouth of the Ohio, there were, on board, ten or a dozen slaves, shackled together with irons. That sight was a continued torment to me, and I see something like it every time I touch the Ohio, or any other slave border. It is hardly fair for you to assume, that I have no interest in a thing which has, and continually exercises, the power of making me miserable. You ought rather to appreciate how much the great body of the northern people do crucify their feelings, in order to maintain their loyalty to the Constitution and the Union. How can anyone who abhors the oppression of Negroes, be in favor of degrading classes of white people? Our progress in degeneracy appears to me to be pretty rapid. As a nation, we began by declaring that, All men are created equal. We now practically read it, All men are created equal, except Negroes. When the know nothings get control, it will read, All men are created equal, except Negroes, and foreigners, and Catholics. When it comes to this, I should prefer emigrating to some country where they make no pretense of loving liberty. To Russia, for instance, where despotism can be taken pure, and without the base alloy of hypocrisy. <inaudible> Lincoln-Douglas debates 1858 <inaudible> 
Many of Lincoln's public anti-slavery sentiments were presented in the seven Lincoln-Douglas debates of 1858 against his opponent, Stephen Douglas, during Lincoln's unsuccessful campaign for a seat in the U.S. Senate which was decided by the Illinois legislature. Douglas advocated, "...popular sovereignty," and self-government, which would give the citizens of a territory the right to decide if slavery would be legal there. Douglas criticized Lincoln as being inconsistent, saying he altered his message and position on slavery and on the political rights of freed blacks in order to appeal to the audience before him, as Northern Illinois was more hostile to slavery than Southern Illinois. Lincoln stated that Negroes had the rights to "...life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness," in the first of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Publicly, Lincoln said he was not advocating Negro suffrage in his speech in Columbus, Ohio on September 16, 1859. This might have been a strategy speech used to gain voters, as Douglas had accused Lincoln of favoring Negroes too much as well. A fragment from Lincoln dated October 1, 1858, refuting theological arguments by Frederick A. Ross in favor of slavery, reads in part, as a good thing, slavery is strikingly peculiar, sick, in this, that it is the only good thing which no man ever seeks the good of, for himself himself. Nonsense. Wolves devouring lambs, not because it is good for their own greedy maws, but because it is good for the lambs. <laughs> 1860 Republican presidential nomination The Republican Party was committed to restricting the growth of slavery, and its victory in the election of 1860 was the trigger for secession acts by southern states. The debate before 1860 was mainly focused on the Western territories, especially Kansas and the popular sovereignty controversy. Lincoln was nominated as the Republican candidate for president in the election of 1860. Lincoln was opposed to the expansion of slavery into new areas, but agreed with nearly all Americans, including most radical abolitionists, that the federal government was prevented by the Constitution from abolishing slavery in states where it already existed. His plan was to halt the spread of slavery, and to offer monetary compensation to slave owners in states that agreed to end slavery see compensated emancipation. He was considered a moderate within a Republican party that, nevertheless, took the radical position that slavery should be put on a course of ultimate extinction, with the help of the federal government. As president-elect in 1860 and 1861 In a letter to Senator Lyman Trumbull on December 10, 1860, Lincoln wrote, "...let there be no compromise on the question of extending slavery." In a letter to John A. Gilmer of North Carolina of December 15, 1860, which was soon published in newspapers, Lincoln wrote that the only substantial difference between North and South was that you think slavery is right and ought to be extended, we think it is wrong and ought to be restricted. Lincoln repeated this statement in a letter to Alexander H. Stevens of Georgia on December 22, 1860 on February 22, 1861, at a speech in Independence Hall, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Lincoln reconfirmed that his convictions sprang from the sentiment expressed in the Declaration of Independence, which was also the basis of the continued existence of the United States since that time, namely, the principle or idea in that declaration giving liberty, not alone to the people of this country, but hope to the world for all future time, great applause, it was that which gave promise that in due time the weights should be lifted from the shoulders of all men, and that all should have an equal chance. Cheers. Presidency 1861 <inaudible> <inaudible> Corwin Amendment The proposed Corwin Amendment was passed by Congress before Lincoln became president and was ratified by two states, but was abandoned once the Civil War began. It would have reaffirmed what historians call the federal consensus the nearly universal belief that under the Constitution the federal government had not power to abolish slavery in a state where it already existed. In his first inaugural address, March 4, 1861, Lincoln explained that, "...holding such a provision to now be implied constitutional law, I have no objection to its being made express and irrevocable." 
The Corwin Amendment was a late attempt at reconciliation but it was doomed to fail because Southerners knew that it would not stop the federal government from adopting a host of anti-slavery policies, without actually violating the federal consensus. Emancipation Lincoln's long-term goal was to apply federal pressure on the slave states to get them to abolish slavery on their own, beginning with the four loyal border states of Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, and Missouri. But he also warned that if the slave states seceded from the Union they would forfeit the constitutional protection of slavery, including any claim to the recovery of their fugitive slave. The American Civil War began in April, 1861, and by the end of May the Lincoln administration approved a policy of not returning fugitive slaves who came within Union lines from disloyal states. Such slaves were deemed contraband of war, or contrabands. On August 6, 1861, Congress declared the forfeiture of contrabands to be permanent, and two days later the Lincoln's War Department issued instructions emancipating all the slaves who came within Union lines from disloyal state or owners. By the end of the year thousands of slaves were being emancipated. Concerned not to alienate the loyal border states, Lincoln was careful to ensure that his generals followed the letter of the law. He encouraged General James K. Lane in western Missouri to emancipate thousands of slaves of disloyal masters who came voluntarily within his lines. But in eastern Missouri, when General John C. Fremont issued a decree emancipating the slaves of disloyal owners in areas the Union did not control, Lincoln ordered the general to revise his decree to conform with the law. Lincoln promoted Lane to brigadier general, but would later fire Fremont for corruption and military incompetence. In western Missouri Lincoln replaced Fremont with an abolitionist general, David Hunter. The care Lincoln took to distinguish legal from extra-legal emancipation was reaffirmed in May, 1862, when Hunter issued two emancipation proclamations from the area his troops recently occupied off the coast of Georgia. The first proclamation, which was legal, freed all the slaves who came within his lines. The second proclamation freed all the slaves in free states, most of them beyond the reach of the Union Army. That second proclamation, like Fremont's, went beyond the law and Lincoln once again reversed it. By the end of 1861 tens of thousands of slaves were emancipated as they came into Union lines at Fortress Monroe, Virginia, the Sea Islands off South Carolina, and in western Missouri. In December the Lincoln administration announced its emancipation policy in a series of annual reports by the president as well as several of his cabinet secretaries. By January Lincoln himself declared that no federal authority, civil or military, could legally return fugitive slaves to their owners. By then the sentiment for a more radical approach to emancipation had been building, and in July Congress authorized the president to issue a more general emancipation proclamation, freeing all the slaves in all areas in rebellion. A few days after Lincoln signed the law known as the Second Confiscation Act he drafted the first version of what would become his Emancipation Proclamation. Because the Constitution could sanction emancipation only as one of the war powers, freeing slaves could only be justified as a means of winning the war and suppressing the Southern Rebellion. As a result, until the very end of the war Lincoln claimed that the purpose of the war was the restoration of the Union. Southern leaders denounced Lincoln as a bloodthirsty revolutionary whose emancipation policies proved that the secessionists were right all along about those they labeled, "...black Republicans." Northern Democrats, meanwhile, denied that emancipation was a military necessity, as Lincoln and the Republicans claimed it was. But Lincoln never deviated from his official position, that because the Constitution recognized slavery in the states the only constitutional justification for freeing slaves was the restoration of the Union. On August 22, 1862 Lincoln published a letter in response to an editorial by Horace Greeley of the New York Tribune in which the editor asked why Lincoln had not yet issued an Emancipation Proclamation, as he was authorized to do by the Second Confiscation Act. In his reply Lincoln differentiated between "...my view of official duty," that is, what he can do in his official capacity as president—and his personal views. Officially he must save the Union above all else, personally he wanted to free all the slaves. I would save the Union. I would save it the shortest way under the Constitution. The sooner the national authority can be restored, the nearer the Union will be. The Union as it was. If there be those who would not save the Union, unless they could at the same time save slavery, I do not agree with them. 
If there be those who would not save the Union unless they could at the same time destroy slavery, I do not agree with them. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union, and is not either to save or to destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave I would do it, and if I could save it by freeing all the slaves I would do it, and if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone I would also do that. What I do about slavery, and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps to save the Union, and what I forbear, I forbear because I do not believe it would help to save the Union. I shall do less whenever I shall believe what I am doing hurts the cause, and I shall do more whenever I shall believe doing more will help the cause. I shall try to correct errors when shown to be errors, and I shall adopt new views so fast as they shall appear to be true views. I have here stated my purpose according to my view of official duty, and I intend no modification of my oft-expressed personal wish that all men everywhere could be free. Just one month after writing this letter, Lincoln issued his preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, which announced that at the beginning of 1863, he would use his war powers to free all slaves in states still in rebellion as they came under Union control. Lincoln scholar Harold Holzer wrote in this context about Lincoln's letter. Unknown to Greeley, Lincoln composed this after he had already drafted a preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, which he had determined to issue after the next Union military victory. Therefore, this letter, was in truth, an attempt to position the impending announcement in terms of saving the Union, not freeing slaves as a humanitarian gesture. It was one of Lincoln's most skillful public relations efforts, even if it has cast long-standing doubt on his sincerity as a liberator." Historian Richard Streiner argues that, for years, Lincoln's letter has been misread as, Lincoln only wanted to save the Union. However, within the context of Lincoln's entire career and pronouncements on slavery this interpretation is wrong, according to Streiner. Rather, Lincoln was softening the strong northern white supremacist opposition to his imminent emancipation by tying it to the cause of the Union. This opposition would fight for the Union but not to end slavery, so Lincoln gave them the means and motivation to do both, at the same time. In his 2014 book, Lincoln's Gamble, journalist and historian Todd Brewster asserted that Lincoln's desire to reassert the saving of the Union as his sole war goal was in fact crucial to his claim of legal authority for emancipation. Since slavery was protected by the Constitution, the only way that he could free the slaves was as a tactic of war—not as the mission itself. But that carried the risk that when the war ended, so would the justification for freeing the slaves. Late in 1862, Lincoln asked his attorney general, Edward Bates, for an opinion as to whether slaves freed through a war-related proclamation of emancipation could be re-enslaved once the war was over. Bates had to work through the language of the Dred Scott decision to arrive at an answer, but he finally concluded that they could indeed remain free. Still, a complete end to slavery would require a constitutional amendment, but a constitutional amendment has to be ratified by three-fourths of the states. There were too many slave states and not enough free states for a constitutional amendment to be ratified, so even as he was preparing to issue his Emancipation Proclamation he proposed a series of constitutional amendments that would make it easier for the federal government to pressure states to abolish slavery on their own, including compensation, a gradual timetable for abolition, and subsidies for blacks willing to colonize themselves outside the United States. None of those constitutional amendments came close to passage. But by 1863 Lincoln had other ways of pressuring the state to abolish slavery, by refusing to return slaves who escaped from loyal masters in loyal states, and by enlisting slaves from loyal states into the Union Army with the promise of emancipation. The Lincoln administration systematically undermined slavery in many of the southern states. Lincoln had begun pressuring the border states to abolish slavery in November, 1861, with no success. In 1862 he began to warn the states that if they did not abolish slavery on their own, the institution would succumb to the incidents of war and would be undermined by mere friction and abrasion. But the abrasive was no mere incident, it was the policy of emancipation. Beginning in mid-1863 Lincoln intensified the pressure on all the slave states, and in early 1864 the policy began to pay off. Between January, 1864, and January, 1865, seven slave states abolished slavery, all under intense pressure from the federal government. By the time the House of Representatives sent the 13th Amendment to the states for ratification the ratio of free to slave states was 27 to 9, or three quarters. Lincoln came to appreciate the role that black troops played in this process. 
In the end some 180,000 blacks served in the Union Army, a disproportionate number of them from the states that ended up abolishing slavery. He made his feeling clear in an eloquent letter a year later to James C. Conkling in August 26, 1863. There was more than a year and a half of trial to suppress the rebellion before the proclamation issued, the last 100 days of which passed under an explicit notice that it was coming, unless averted by those in revolt, returning to their allegiance. The war has certainly progressed as favorably for us, since the issue of proclamation is before. I know, as fully as one can know the opinions of others, that some of the commanders of our armies in the field who have given us our most important successes believe the emancipation policy and the use of the colored troops constitute the heaviest blow yet dealt to the rebellion, and that at least one of these important successes could not have been achieved when it was but for the aid of black soldiers. Among the commanders holding these views are some who have never had any affinity with what is called abolitionism or with the Republican Party policies but who held them purely as military opinions. I submit these opinions as being entitled to some weight against the objections often urged that emancipation and arming the blacks are unwise as military measures and were not adopted as such in good faith. You say you will not fight to free Negroes. Some of them seem willing to fight for you, but, no matter. Fight you, then exclusively to save the Union. I issued the proclamation on purpose to aid you in saving the Union. Whenever you shall have conquered all resistance to the Union, if I shall urge you to continue fighting, it will be an apt time, then, for you to declare you will not fight to free Negroes. I thought that in your struggle for the Union, to whatever extent the Negroes should cease helping the enemy, to that extent it weakened the enemy in his resistance to you. Do you think differently? I thought that whatever Negroes can be got to do as soldiers, leaves just so much less for white soldiers to do, in saving the Union. Does it appear otherwise to you? But Negroes, like other people, act upon motives. Why should they do anything for us, if we will do nothing for them? If they stake their lives for us, they must be prompted by the strongest motive—even the promise of freedom. And the promise being made, must be kept. Peace does not appear so distant as it did. I hope it will come soon, and come to stay, and so come as to be worth the keeping in all future time. It will then have been proved that, among free men, there can be no successful appeal from the ballot to the bullet, and that they who take such appeal are sure to lose their case, and pay the cost. And then, there will be some black men who can remember that, with silent tongue, and clenched teeth, and steady eye, and well-poised bayonet, they have helped mankind on to this great consummation, while, I fear, there will be some white ones, unable to forget that, with malignant heart, and deceitful speech, they strove to hinder it. The timing of the Conkling letter is important. Lincoln issued it in August of 1863, the month after two great Union victories at Gettysburg and Vicksburg, but also at a time when Americans were reading the first reports of black troops fighting courageously in battles at Milliken's Bend and Battery Wagner. It was also in the summer of 1863 that Lincoln initiated his intensified effort to get various slave states to abolish slavery on their own. Lincoln addresses the changes to his positions and actions regarding emancipation in an 1864 letter to Albert G. Hodges. In that letter, Lincoln states his ethical opposition to slavery, writing, I am naturally anti-slavery. If slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I can not remember when I did not so think, and feel. And yet I have never understood that the presidency conferred upon me an unrestricted right to act officially upon this judgment and feeling." Lincoln further explained that he had eventually determined that military emancipation and the enlistment of black soldiers were necessary for the preservation of the Union, which was his responsibility as president. Having won re-election to the presidency in November of 1864, Lincoln and several members of his cabinet embarked on a sustained lobbying effort to get the abolition amendment through the House of Representatives. The amendment abolishing slavery everywhere in the United States was ratified by every state that had abolished slavery during the war, and it became part of the Constitution in December, 1865. Reconstruction. In December 1863, Lincoln used his war powers and issued a proclamation for amnesty and reconstruction, which offered southern states a chance to peacefully rejoin the Union if they abolished slavery and collected loyalty oaths from 10% of their voting population. Topic: 13th Amendment. 
When Lincoln accepted the nomination for the Union Party for President in June, 1864, he called for the first time for the passage of the Thirteenth Amendment to the United States Constitution, to immediately abolish slavery and involuntary servitude, except as punishment for a crime. He wrote in his letter of acceptance that, "...it would make a fitting and necessary conclusion," to the war and would permanently join the causes of, "...liberty and union." He won re-election on this platform in November, and in December, 1864, Lincoln worked to have the House approve the amendment. When the House passed the Thirteenth Amendment on January 31, 1865, Lincoln signed the amendment, although this was not a legal requirement, and said in a speech the next day, "...he thought all would bear him witness that he had never shrunk from doing all that he could to eradicate slavery by issuing an Emancipation Proclamation." He pointed out that the Emancipation Proclamation did not complete the task of eradicating slavery, but this amendment is a king's cure for all the evils of slavery. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Compensated Emancipation, buy out the slave owners. He made numerous proposals for compensated emancipation in the loyal border states whereby the federal government would purchase all of the slaves and free them. Each state government refused to act. President Lincoln advocated that slave owners be compensated for emancipated slaves. On March 6, 1862 President Lincoln in a message to the U.S. Congress stated that emancipating slaves would create economic inconveniences and justified compensation to the slave owners. The resolution was adopted by Congress, however, the southern states refused to comply. On July 12, 1862 President Lincoln in a conference with congressmen from Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware, and Missouri encouraged their respective states to adopt emancipation legislation that gave compensation to the slave owners. On July 14, 1862 President Lincoln sent a bill to Congress that allowed the Treasury to issue bonds at 6% interest to states for slave emancipation compensation to the slave owners. The bill was never voted on by Congress. As late as the Hampton Roads Conference in 1865, Lincoln met with Confederate leaders and proposed a fair indemnity, possibly $500 million, in compensation for emancipated slaves. Topic. Colonization Colonization of freed slaves was long seen by many as an answer to the problem of slavery. One of President Abraham Lincoln's policies during his administration was the voluntary colonization of African American freedmen. He firmly opposed compulsory colonization, and in one instance ordered the Secretary of War to bring some colonized blacks back to the United States. The Pre-Emancipation Proclamation offered support for the colonization of free blacks outside of the United States. Historians have debated and have remained divided over whether Lincoln's racial views or merely his acceptance of the political reality included that African Americans could not live in the same society as white Americans due to racism. Benjamin Butler stated that Lincoln in 1865 firmly denied that racial harmony would be possible in the United States. One view known to scholars as the lullaby theory is that Lincoln adopted colonization for freedmen in order to make his Emancipation Proclamation politically acceptable. This view has been challenged with new evidence of the Lincoln administration's attempts to colonize freedmen in British Honduras after the Emancipation Proclamation took effect on January 1, 1863. Topic: <laughs> Bureau of Emigration. President Lincoln supported colonization during the Civil War as a practical response to newly freed slaves. At his urging, Congress included text in the Confiscation Act of 1862 indicating support for presidential authority to recolonize consenting African Americans. With this authorization, Lincoln created an agency to direct his colonization projects. At the suggestion of Lincoln, in 1862, Congress appointed $600,000 to fund and created the Bureau of Emigration in the U.S. Department of the Interior. To head that office Lincoln appointed the energetic Reverend James Mitchell, a leader of the American Colonization Party. Lincoln had known Mitchell since 1853, when Mitchell visited Illinois. Mitchell's Washington, D.C.'s office was in charge of implementing Lincoln's voluntary colonization policy of African Americans. In his annual December message to Congress that year, his second 
State of the Union message, he reiterated his strong support for government expenditure on colonization for those who wanted to go, but he also noted that objections to free blacks remaining in the United States were baseless, if not sometimes malicious. In 1862, Lincoln mentioned colonization favorably in his preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. Much concerning the controversial Bureau of Emigration is unknown today, as Mitchell's papers that kept record of the office were lost after his death in 1903. <laughs> Cherokee Improvement Company President Lincoln first proposed a Panama colony for blacks in October 1861. Several hundred acres of Cherokee province in Panama then a part of Gran Colombia had in 1855 been granted to the Cherokee Improvement Company for coal mining. The company supplied the U.S. Navy with half-price coal during the war, but required more workers. Congress gravitated towards this plan in mid-1862, and Lincoln appointed Kansas Senator Samuel Pomeroy to oversee it. Pomeroy promised 40 acres and a job to willing blacks, and chose 500 of 13,700 who applied. Lincoln signed a contract with businessman Ambrose W. Thompson, the owner of the land, and made plans to send tens of thousands of African Americans. Pomeroy secured $25,000 from Congress to pay for transportation and equipment. The plan was suspended in early October 1862 before a single ship sailed though, apparently due to diplomatic protests from neighboring Central American governments and the uncertainty raised by the Colombian Civil War 1862-1862. The plan also violated the 1850 Clayton Bulwer Treaty prohibiting US and UK colonization of Central America. Lincoln hoped to overcome these complications by having Congress make provision for a treaty for African American emigration, much as he outlined in his second annual message of December 1, 1862, but the Cherokee plan appears to have died over the new year of 1863 as revelations of the corrupt interest of his acquaintance Richard W. Thompson and Secretary of the Interior John Palmer Usher likely proved too much to bear in political terms. Ile Vache In December 1862, Lincoln signed a contract with businessman Bernard Koch to establish a colony on the Ile Vache, an island of Haiti. 453 freed slaves departed for the island from Fort Monroe, Virginia. A government investigation had deemed Koch untrustworthy, and Secretary of State William Seward stopped the plan from going forward after learning of Koch's involvement. Poor planning, an outbreak of smallpox, and financial mismanagement by Koch left the colonists under supplied and starving, according to early reports. 292 colonists remained on Ile Vache in 1865, 73 had moved to Ox Kai on Haiti. The United States Navy arrived to rescue survivors after less than one year on the island. <inaudible> <inaudible> British West Indies In addition to Panama and Haiti, Mitchell's office also oversaw attempts at colonization in British Honduras and elsewhere in the British West Indies. Lincoln believed that by dealing with the comparatively stable British government, he could avoid some of the problems that plagued his earlier attempts at colonization with private interests. He signed an agreement on June 13, 1863, with John Hodge of British Honduras that authorized colonial agents to recruit ex slaves and transport them to Belize from approved ports in Philadelphia, New York City, and Boston. Later that year the Department of the Interior sent John Willis Menard, a free African-American clerk who supported colonization, to investigate the site for the government. British authorities pulled out of the agreement in December, fearing it would disrupt their position of neutrality in the Civil War. The question of when Lincoln abandoned colonization, if ever, has aroused considerable debate among historians. The government funded no more colonies after the rescue of the Ile of Vache survivors in early 1864, and Congress repealed most of the colonization funding that July. Whether Lincoln's opinion had changed is unknown. He left no surviving statements in his own hand on the subject during the last two years of his presidency, although he apparently wrote Attorney General Edward Bates in November 1864 to inquire whether earlier legislation allowed him to continue pursuing colonization and to retain Mitchell's services irrespective of the loss of funding. An entry in the diary of Presidential Secretary John Hay dated July 2, 1864, says that Lincoln had sloughed off' 
Colonization, though without much elaboration. In a later report, General Benjamin F. Butler claimed that Lincoln approached him in 1865 a few days before his assassination, to talk about reviving colonization in Panama. Historians have long debated the validity of Butler's account, as it was written many years after the fact and Butler was prone to exaggeration of his own exploits as a general. Recently discovered documents prove that Butler and Lincoln did indeed meet on April 11, 1865, though whether and to what extent they talked about colonization is not recorded except in Butler's account. On that same day, Lincoln gave a speech supporting a form of limited suffrage for blacks. Much of the present debate revolves around whether to accept Butler's story. If rejected, then it appears that Lincoln sloughed off colonization at some point in mid-1864. If it is accepted, then Lincoln remained a colonizationist at the time of his death. This question is compounded by the unclear meaning of Hay's diary, and another article by Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells, which suggests that Lincoln intended to revive colonization in his second term. In either case, the implications for understanding Lincoln's views on race and slavery are strong. Topic: <laughs> Citizenship and limited suffrage. In his second term as president, on April 11, 1865, Lincoln gave a speech in which he promoted voting rights for blacks. John Wilkes Booth, a Southerner and outspoken Confederate sympathizer attended the speech and became determined to kill Lincoln for supporting citizenship for blacks. On April 14, 1865, three days later, Lincoln was assassinated by Booth and died the next day. In analyzing Lincoln's position historian Eugene H. Berwanger notes, during his presidency, Lincoln took a reasoned course which helped the federal government both destroy slavery and advance the cause of black suffrage. For a man who had denied both reforms four years earlier, Lincoln's change in attitude was rapid and decisive. He was both open-minded and perceptive to the needs of his nation in a post-war era. Once committed to a principle, Lincoln moved toward it with steady, determined progress. Topic. Views on African Americans Known as the Great Emancipator, Lincoln was a complicated figure who wrestled with his own views on race. Through changing times successive generations have interpreted Lincoln's views on African Americans differently. To apply 20th century beliefs and standards to an America of 1858 and declare Abraham Lincoln a racist is a faulty formula that unfairly distorts Lincoln's true role in advancing civil and human rights. By the standards of his time, Lincoln's views on race and equality were progressive and truly changed minds, policy and most importantly, hearts for years to come." Lincoln's primary audience was white voters. Lincoln's views on slavery, race equality, and African American colonization are often intermixed. During the 1858 debates with Stephen Douglas, Lincoln expressed his then view that he believed whites were superior to blacks. Lincoln stated he was against miscegenation and allowing blacks to serve as jurors. While president, as the American Civil War progressed, Lincoln advocated or implemented anti-racist policies including the Emancipation Proclamation and limited suffrage for African Americans. Former slave and leading abolitionist Frederick Douglass unequivocally regarded Lincoln as sharing the prejudices of his white fellow countrymen against the Negro, but also observed of Lincoln that, in his company, I was never reminded of my humble origin, or of my unpopular color. Douglas attested to Lincoln's genuine respect for him and other blacks and to the wisdom of his course of action in obtaining both the preservation of the Union his sworn duty as president and the freeing of the slaves. In an 1876 speech he defended Lincoln's actions thus, his great mission was to accomplish two things, first, to save his country from dismemberment and ruin, and, second, to free his country from the great crime of slavery. To do one or the other, or both, he must have the earnest sympathy and the powerful cooperation of his loyal fellow countrymen. Without this primary and essential condition to success his efforts must have been vain and utterly fruitless. Had he put the abolition of slavery before the salvation of the Union, he would have inevitably driven from him a powerful class of the American people and rendered resistance to rebellion impossible. 
Viewed from the genuine abolition ground, Mr. Lincoln seemed tardy, cold, dull, and indifferent, but measuring him by the sentiment of his country, a sentiment he was bound as a statesman to consult, he was swift, zealous, radical, and determined. Taking him for all in all, measuring the tremendous magnitude of the work before him, considering the necessary means to ends, and surveying the end from the beginning, infinite wisdom has seldom sent any man into the world better fitted for his mission than Abraham Lincoln. In his past, Lincoln lived in a middle-class, racially mixed neighborhood of Springfield, Illinois. One of his longtime neighbors, Jameson Jenkins, who may have been born a slave, had come from North Carolina and was publicly implicated in the 1850s as a Springfield conductor on the Underground Railroad, sheltering escaped slaves. In 1861, Lincoln called on Jenkins to give him a ride to the train depot, where Lincoln delivered his farewell address before leaving Springfield for the last time. See also Abraham Lincoln and Emancipation Lincoln on Slavery George Washington and Slavery Thomas Jefferson and Slavery John Quincy Adams and Abolitionism Timeline of the African-American Civil Rights Movement